Thanks for joining me today. I really appreciate it. What I'm going to be talking about is a presentation I gave a couple of weeks ago at SEMI's International Trade Partners Conference in Hawaii. It's quite the honor to be able to speak there, but I was also honored by the 80 or so people that chose to come because they wanted to come to the conference. It's a very important conference held every year, uh, which is mainly attended by very senior executives. The, uh, um, of course, attendance was down, so I really appreciate the brave souls that chose to affirm the importance of our industry by being at this conference because it's all about partners. So anyway, uh, let's get into the presentation. What I chose to talk about was new challenges, greater opportunities. And as usual, I used uh, my photos. And in this case, I used my uh, Hawaii photos since I was in Hawaii for semi-IDPC. So, um, and, you know, I really think the last two years has been like this, you know, monstrous volcano just spewing out and uh, keeping us uh, there. And if you're wondering, that's Venus over there on the uh, on the right hand side. So let's dig into it. Uh, you know, one of the things is, is in the last year, VLSI was purchased by Tech Insights. And so I wanted to tell the community what we what they were about. And they're the world's largest reverse engineering firm. And, and, and they literally reverse engineer everything, you know, from the angstrom level to the Audi size level. And, uh, you know, they really have an unmatched breadth of knowledge about technology and what's the guts of the technology with hundreds of employees with deep engineering experience. So uh, um, anyway, they're also based out of Ottawa. The, uh, uh, the reason why they bought us was the vision was to really become the world's best technology information platform. Um, they were acquired by VLS. Uh, they acquired us in last year. Uh, and when I asked Kevin Carter, in fact, when he was talking, uh, announcing it, he essentially said that we were the best, world's best in market research. That's why he wanted us. That's why we're here. So, uh, and I'm hoping it's going to be an explosive combination like lava hitting the sea. So anyway, let's get into the actual content of the presentation. Uh, you know, when we started the year in 2020 and we started getting into the COVID, it really looked like we were going to jump off into the ocean. And uh, um, uh, it was pretty bad. We, we got a decoupling from the macro economy at the time. Everyone was sure there was going to be a huge downturn because we, we'd we been coupled to the macro economy for so long. The big surprise was there was a decoupling of the economy. Um, I'd actually made that argument uh, back in uh, March of 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 2020, and uh, that was because the uh, we were seeing a pull in of digitization. If you looked at the data rates that were occurring, uh, the companies were just you know seeing the kind of data rates that they would see over a Christmas holiday, where everyone was on TV or or talking on phones all the time or, or doing video and video conferencing just absolutely exploded, as you know. So that eventually, you know, the other big issue that's hit us in the last year or two has been really the shortage and the capacity constraints that it's brought. Uh, and the capacity constraints have become really tight because there's no white space in order to fill the fabs with more equipment. If you don't have the white space, you can't build, you can't fill the clean room, you can't get more capacity. So you've seen this explosion of building of clean rooms here in the last year or so. Um, the other big thing that really started in 2015, 2016, was the drive for technology sovereignty, which is G really kind of infected globalization pretty badly in 2015. Trump really spread it in 2016, and you know really trying to you know kill globalization. Uh, along with you know you get free money, you get new taxes coming in, and. Uh, you know, the interesting thing about it is everybody wants to give money to technology, but at the same time, they want to take it away. And that's actually pulling down the stock valuations. And certainly in the United States, you can see a distinction, and that's definitely a challenge. Then there's the China Enigma, which I'm going to talk about briefly, and then the Taiwan hypercoherence, which really is a fundamental issue affecting the world uh, because of their dominance in semiconductors. Anyway, let's go back to COVID and talk about uh, the semiconductor weather storms. 
essentially uh, uh, what happened back then was uh, we all saw storms in the first quarter of 2020. By the second quarter, it was kind of foggy. We were beginning to think, well, maybe things are going to get better. And then it just got consistently sunny, sunnier all the way into the second quarter of, of this year. And uh, it's cooled off a little bit since then, but it's really been a amazing turn. If you go back to that time frame, we were just coming out of the 2019 uh, downturn. And uh, with the shutdowns, there was a zero visibility past March. And this shows if you were looking at the world from a quarterly perspective, this is the data path you would have seen as you were trying to project forward. And, you know, would you predict sideways? Probably maybe down. Uh, uh, and, and realize that the first quarter results would not be available to early May. So, so all you had was that last quarter of the year. So, so as you um, begin to look forward, you begin to think it's either flat or down, right? Well, here's what happened. You know, I mean, if you looked at the monthly data, you, most people were looking at that and seeing that monthly trend uh, channel pointing directly down. Uh, as you go further, as we get to where we are today, no, it went straight up. Didn't follow that at all. And uh, you can see from both the monthly and the and the quarterly data that the uh, uh, the channel just really exploded, although the volatility was much higher, which indicates there was a lot more fear, which is perfectly understandable. But our industry had pretty much prepared the world for the COVID moment because with all of the, the video teleconferencing, the communications capability, uh, we really made it possible for the world's economy to survive and not go into a Great Depression. <clears throat> we look at it from a four-week moving average perspective, uh, what was going on weekly, you can see that volatility. You can see it went way down. And in fact, February 2020 was much deeper than what we'd seen in December of 19, which really was December, February 19 was was the beginning of the of the prior downturn. So that's why most people expected it to just continue to drop down. Didn't happen. You know, as you can see here, the weekly data, yeah, we got a lot of volatility, uh, extreme volatility at the beginning of, of both years, um, but uh, it's been pretty much straight up. And uh, if you look at the growth levels, the growths have been astounding. We're looking at 30 plus percent growth on a quarter by quarter as we've gone into the third quarter. It's starting to tamper down, um, but you know, 30% is very, very abnormal. Uh, in fact, Given history, we might worry that it's a downturn because it's it's so high. Um, but the cool thing is we're going to be we're, we've blown past a half a trillion dollars this year. Everybody talks about hitting a trillion dollars by 2030. Well, it's only 2021 and we're half a trillion. So we're definitely going to hit a trillion dollars by 2030. And even logic today, it's a quarter of a trillion dollars. And uh, uh, and it looks like. Uh, uh, DRAM is going to turn out to be a tenth of a trillion. So anyway, a billion is no longer cool. It's a trillion dollars that it takes to be cool these days in an industry. And the semiconductor industry is going to get halfway there this year. So uh, if we look at the uh, uh, what happened, 2020-21 or 2021 was a up 24% overall. That's what we're, we think it's going to wind up being. Growth is about four to five times trend. Uh, and we're really looking uh, at, you know, things slowing down in the next year. Although as we talk now going into, you know, a few weeks later from when this data was done, it's looking like the 10% for 2022 might be really conservative. The big issue is how can we get the capacity going? The other one is the degree to which inflation is going to affect prices. And uh, it's beginning to look like inflation could add another 5 10% to that 10% number. So uh, uh, as we, in terms of chip prices, and that will also accelerate demand. So uh, if we look at the critical segments, here you see semiconductor sales growth. Uh, auto went through a huge slump and they actually created their own downturn. I gave a presentation the week after this at the MOVE conference and at ITPC, which I will also record and post that and uh, you'll see, I talk a lot more about what affected the auto shortage. But as you can see, the shortage came because they cut their spending and they just accelerated. 
Uh, the other segments, analog and power is capacity constrained. It's also constrained and so is auto because the auto companies are shutting down their factories. And so we're beginning to see at the macro level, auto slowing, even though um, there's a shortage because there's only a shortage in various segments. So overall, we should see slower growth next year. But you know, in a way, to, do you worry about it? If you look to the peak to current CAGRs, they're really not out of line if you go back to the peak in the late 2019. In fact, if we look at the uh, the absolute sales uh, going back with 13 week moving averages of weekly sales, um, and there's a typo in this chart, it shouldn't say that they, the, the CAGRs from this peak are really abnormally high. It should be they're not really abnormally high. Uh, you know, a you know, DRAM is still in negative growth compared to how it peaked at the you know mid December of 2019. Uh, autos at 8%, it, you know, that's not really a high growth number for auto. Maybe it should be around six, and logic could be six, seven percent. But given the the decoupling from the macro economy and the digitization being pulled in, I think that's right up there with the three percent, five percent plus number that. I had predicted in, in uh, March of 2020 that we could see uh, due to the pull in of digitization uh, into the uh, uh, driving the economy's growth going forward. So uh, if anything, we're still relatively conservative. So, and in terms of the shortage, as you look forward, you know, the supply demand map, uh, you know, obviously the uh, uh, first quarter shortage as of last week, of, of when I just did this data, uh, which is being published today, uh, the fourth quarter for auto moved back to shortage. Um, and uh, we've seen pretty much tight conditions going throughout the area. Uh, DRAM was in a glut in the summer, uh, late summer into September. That's moved to saturated and more recently just to uh, loose. Uh, but everything is getting tight again as we move into the end of the year. That's not a normal condition as we, you know, certainly we would normally expect that once we get past Thanksgiving, um, things will get uh, looser. Uh, we're not seeing that, that historical trend happening at this point. So, so anyway, uh, if we look at auto IC sales, we expect them to grow about 11% next year as they tail off. A lot of this is just simply the comps are a little, little lighter. If we look at analog, ICs and power discretes. Uh, we also expect those those growths are slowing, so we expect to see slower growth going into 2022. So about 11 percent growth versus 29 percent this year. And uh, as for logic, it was around 21 percent this year. We're seeing it slow steadily to about nine percent. Uh, like I said, this is a very early forecast. A lot changes, so stay tuned with uh, the what we're saying on our website between now and uh, say January, February, Andrea will be giving a presentation at ITPC that will give you a, a full update to the forecast. And uh, soon I'll be recording the normal annual memory forecast with Jim Handy, which is a, is a memory expert. As we talk about DRAM, speaking of memory experts, we're forecasting it's gonna grow about 16% this year. Uh, uh, 21 was about 40%. It's all being driven by for data, also higher automotive content and smartphone driven. Um, you know, as autos communicate globally, as they get all these high powered performance ATIS, they need a lot more memory. So that's the big change here. NAND is another area that is growing uh, and uh, slowing. Here, there's been actually slower data center penetration we've seen because IT managers have become a lot more concerned about the reliability of VNAND uh, SSDs in terms of uh, they've been having a lot more problems with them. So that's been an issue. And so often they're kind of falling back to magnetic uh, hard disk drives. Now here's where the shortage is. What's really phenomenal is the capacity utilization rates. When you look at, at uh, Semiconductors uh, moving averages, it's really uh, crazy going into September. We're uh, at uh, the 90, you know, we were in a 98% level um, for test fab assembly. 
it's really crazy. And what happens is, is one of the reasons why the shortage is conditioned, at those capacity utilization, there's no flexibility in manufacturing to move a so-called hot lot through production and get it through instead of the normal 13, 14 week cycle time, get it through in, in a week or two, three weeks types of cycle. So that's why everything's really gone on hold as we uh, look forward. As we look at the uh, uh, inventories, inventories, absolute inventories are high, but the inventory to billing ratios is actually relatively low. We're in an expansionary range at this point. It's about 0.3 um, months below critical levels that we would consider a pullback. Uh, and, um, you know, total uh, IC inventories were actually in decline through uh, uh, 2019 going into 2020. So we started off relatively low. So the important number to look at is the inventory to billings ratio. I will caution though that it is a lagging indicator. As far as electronics pricing, we've also seen electronic pricing uh, decline. It's bottomed more recently. That's very concerning to us because it tells us that uh, uh, it tends to be a very early predictor of things being soft in the following year. And that's one of the reasons why we're cautious about 2022 when we did this particular forecast uh, back in uh, October, uh, late October, early November. Uh, what about, is the industry overheated or underheated? Well, if you look at the history of going all the way back when we started doing weekly back in 2000, 2008, we actually, 2007 was, was more sort of reckon, you know, pulling in the data and creating it because we started this in 2008 in order to deal with the uh, the problems of the uh, the great financial uh, crisis. The uh, uh, when we came out of that, the industry hit 63 percent peaks. When we came out of when we hit the the big memory bubble in 2017, uh, coming out of 2016, we were 34 percent. We're still actually not above those levels, and so. Um, you know, at this point, I'm not concerned that we see a, a deep downturn like we saw in, say, 2012, 2019. If there is, it's possibly in 2023. That's what we're currently predicting. If you look at absolute sales, same type, same numbers, but this is sales, not growth. What you can see is, is uh, COVID-19 just sort of created a W and forced the, the slowdown to be a little bit longer in the beginning. Uh, production was down, but then it came back and we're still above trend. We are beginning to look at, you know, similar levels to what we saw in the memory bubble. Another reason for caution about 2022 growth continuing in this 20, 30 percent types of growth levels for the uh, IC industry. Now, let's talk about globalization and the end of globalization. You know, as I mentioned earlier, it really started with G. Um, but, you know, while it was a very complex, you know, everybody from Europe, uh, Brazil, you know, the chips were all going back and forth across the globe with most of the production being based in South Korea and uh, uh, Taiwan. You know, all within the, uh, 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 the range of the Chinese Air Force. And that's what got everybody concerned starting in around 2016, 2017, and the pressure began to be pushed on uh, really on TSMC to build a factory in the U.S. and on Samsung to build a factory in the U.S., which we now know that pressure, that political pressure came to be true and uh, happened uh, this uh, more recent year. In fact, uh, the talk at uh, ITBC was that uh, President Trump had really pressured uh, 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 TSMC and uh, uh, and then he offered to offer them some cash if they put the factory here, and the cash has never come through. Uh, so anyway, that's just sort of the uh, uh, the talk of what people were were saying at that time. So anyway, this is the uh, 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 this is the picture. And now, as you know, you start to talk about uh, technology sovereignty. All these countries are talking about wanting a fab now, whether it's the US, they want to level the playing field. You know, China started it in 2015, then Trump accelerated it. Then now you've seen China, you've seen Japan, you've seen Europe, uh, all want to get their own factories. This chart, those, those, uh, those little um, uh, pillars there represent countries that could actually afford to build a mini fab. 
uh, whether they will or not is is a really a question of political will. And uh, historically, if you look at like, for example, Brazil and India, they've always, for decades, they wanted to have a fab. They, they've never had the political persistence to stick with it. And so it's always coming on. But there is certainly a lot of, of activity going on there. Um, what about new taxes? You know, the U.S. Is, has the the CHIPS Act is going to bring more money into the industry. But what happened when they started talking about that tax hike? If you look at the valuations of, you know, average stock prices of U.S. stocks versus non-U.S. stocks, since they started talking about uh, raising taxes in January, uh, when I put this chart out there, there was a 15 percent uh, percentage point gap between uh, U.S. stocks and, and non-U.S. stocks in terms of how non-U.S. stocks were outperforming. So taxes really do affect valuations, which affect the ability of those companies to get the kind of funding they need to build out the infrastructure in your local country. Critical issue uh, and uh, have to caution, you know, politicians to think they should, you know, that the taxes uh, come free without damage to infrastructure or jobs. As far as the uh, scale trail, you know, one of the things when I talk about uh, Taiwan's hypercoherence, hypercoherence is a chaos theory technical term. And it basically means when everything becomes so current, so, so coherent, so tightly linked that all you have to do is, is uh, break one link in the chain and everyone loses. And, you know, to a great extent, you know, Taiwan started with their concept of a silicon shield way back in the, in the 80s and you know late 70s when uh, uh, you know when the US started talking about you know you know as soon as Nixon dropped recognition of Taiwan and then <clears throat> moved it to China and then there was questions of how could Taiwan be defend have a defensive shield uh, they chose silicon as the best option and that's and they called it a silicon shield <clears throat> they've been surrounded between the US in China in this way, Xi came, but now they're really losing it. They they can't afford to because what's happened is they become too dominant, too important. If you go back 10 years ago, uh, the difference between TSMC's uh, production capacity and Intel's uh, was about 2x. Now it's more than 3x and it's headed towards 5x at the current at the current growth as, as we start to look into the end of the decade. If something isn't done, uh, TSMC you know, really needs to expand outside of uh, outside of Taiwan. And uh, if you add Korea in, and if you look at what's going on there, those two today are half of semiconductor production, South Korea and and uh, and Taiwan. You know, Japan had a, a real heyday as it rose up to about 45% in 1990. Uh, that was about where it peaked around that time frame and then started to fall. The U.S. has been falling since the 1960s with a brief resurgence in Y2K, uh, and, you know, to fill up the slack with uh, with Taiwan. But as the fabulous, I mean, fill up the slack with Japan, but as the fabulous came along, Taiwan really uh, uh, began to surge, and so did South Korea. Uh, by the way, reports that uh, Europe made uh, uh, half of semiconductor production in 2000. Europe's never held half of semiconductor production. So uh, uh, those that data is is really based on some fallacious assumptions. Anyway, what about innovation? Innovation is really exciting. Uh, we have uh, our um, I, there, I could spend the whole days talking about all of these opportunities in terms of the, the chip innovation in, uh, innovation. But I love this chart because it shows all of the exciting thing from zooming lifestyles, COVID, mo modern monetary theory, quantum computing. Uh, factory 4.0 and semiconductors. We've got gate all around coming, heterogeneous integration. Moore's law is on, on uh, virtually on steroids when you go to heterogeneous and vertical integration. And then when we go to equipment and materials, we've got you know high NAUV coming. We've got multi beam litho inspection, optical direct right. Just so many things happening. Material system engineering. It's all pretty exciting. So uh, and then when you look at the individual device technologies themselves. Uh, from DRAM to NAND to LAP. LAP is an acronym I use to uh, discuss logic, analog, and power, which is where you see all of the foundries really focused.
So anyway, lots of cool stuff like dry resist, EUV, high NA, uh, gate all around, uh, uh, hole thinning and man, um, um, 2D nano sheets, just, just so many cool things. So anyway, I want to thank you. Uh, and uh, I hope you all uh, have a great Thanksgiving, even if you're not in America. Uh, just give thanks to the prosperity we've had this year coming off the COVID because it looked pretty dark in 2020 and the early months. And, uh, and to borrow from Lao Tzu, uh, mastering uh, others is strength, mastering yourself is true power. So thank you very much. I appreciate that.